is there a minion of young people here, or am I seeing a sea of gray hair? <laughs> no, I, I'm used to giving talks about Jewish humor, and uh, I wanted this book to be educational because I'm an educator, and I had hoped that I would bring in some of the young people uh, who, um, shall we say, maybe at least in the demographic are under the age of a half a century or so. <laughs> this does look like a PBS crowd in some ways. Um, <laughs> which is also a compliment to how handsome this crowd looks. That's how the old Jewish comics used to do it and win an audience over. It's also um, edifying for me to always to come back to Stanford, and I have Charlie to thank for that. I did a, uh, something for the teaching company many years ago. I've always been a little alarmed at that name, but um, sounds oxymoronic. The um, program that I did was a DVD and CD series called Masterpieces of Short Fiction, and Charlie actually uh, asked me based on seeing those and, or hearing them to come here and teach a course in continuing education. That's how things started in terms of my connection to Stanford and continuing ed. When you hear Charlie, you think we should hire him for a pledge drive. Those are very nice remarks about KQED too, which are appreciated. I am going to talk about my book and Jewish humor though. I know that's what uh, you're here to say, uh, to, to listen to and hear me talk about. But I have to say one other thing, and that is when I'm on the Stanford campus, I always think of kind of a metaphor for Stanford in some ways because one of the first times I had taught a class here, I have a friend some of you may know by the name of Tobias Wolf, who is head of the creative writing department and is a much deservedly admired fiction writer. And I was teaching his fiction in the course I taught and I said, Toby, would you come to a class and I'll be teaching your fiction, talk to the class. And he said, sure, a generous man that he is. And uh, he said, let's meet by the Rodin statues and so I went over by the museum where I thought from my map the Rodin statues were. And Toby wasn't there and then he showed up in the class and we figured out that he meant the other Rodin statues. And I realized at that moment just how wealthy this campus is. Um, <laughs> you have more Rodin statues here than you do at the Rodin Museum in Paris. But I am gonna talk about Jewish humor today and let me speak first about the genesis of this book to some degree. Uh, I just recently ran into another famous fiction writer who said, oh, I loved your joke book. And I felt myself recoiling a little bit <laughs> because it's not really a joke book. Uh, there are a lot of jokes in this book and I'm glad to say that I share the bounty of jokes that have been around for a long time and jokes that perhaps some of you who know a lot of jokes like I did have not heard. I think. I was saying to Charlie, there's an old Talmudic saying, make me more than I am, you make me less than I am. And there is part of the hype of this book is he knows more Jewish jokes than anybody alive. That's something that empirically can never be proven. But I do know and did know a lot of Jewish jokes. And what I thought would be interesting would be to try to do what I do with literature. That is, analyze them, talk about them in a cultural and anthropological way and talk about their meaning and subtextual meaning and really get at, because jokes are really narratives and jokes are narratives that sometimes disclose what's in the unconscious. As I've gotten older, I become, shall we say, less uh, uh, enthusiastic about Freud. That's maybe putting it mildly. Um, I just gave a talk to the Psychoanalytic Institute and I felt they maybe wanted to tar and feather me after the talk was over. There are still things though that we need to value in Freud. And one of them I think is a book he did called Jokes in the Unconscious or depending on the German translation, Wit in the Unconscious. And he talks about jokes as outlets of aggression and outlets of repression, obviously often sexual repression, but also um, of concealed meanings and, and the like and often fantasies too. So there's so much to really kind of unpack in looking at jokes. And I found myself wanting to do that but getting into other areas as well, getting into film and getting into uh, television and anecdotes and many of the interviews I did because the reality is that Jewish humor has been an extraordinary part of American humor and it's really in many ways a hybridized form of Jewish American humor but it has had a preeminent role in terms of the history of humor not only because of all the comedians but also because of all the comedy writers and all the people who have been in the comedy business uh, the actor, uh, some of you may know, Peter Coyote, once said to me, yeah, it was a business for we Jews. You know, it was less, sort of like, you know, some people, I mean, Koreans have grocery stores and uh, Chinese people have laundries and P Italians have pizzerias. We have humor. And we have other things as well, perhaps, I'm speaking of the we, but certainly humor was a mainstay for a long period of time. And when I finished this book, one of the hardest things I had to do, the book came out actually fairly easily in some ways. I mean, you, you write a book, it does take you through research and through time spent on the writing and the rewriting and redacting. 
But one of the things that I was amazed at was the fact that in writing this book, I began to realize things uh, and have insights about Jewish humor and especially the role that it's played in American humor that I hadn't even imagined I would find. That's one of the exciting things about writing a book, frankly. And as I said, one of my original intentions was to educate, but it was also to make people laugh. Um, this book could have been an elegy because a lot of this Jewish humor is gone and a lot of people don't tell jokes anymore. In fact, uh, a lot of comedians don't even do shtick anymore because they go on college campuses and they feel, and I've been told this by a number of comedians I've interviewed, that they feel that they can't let loose of certain kinds of humorous uh, stories because of what they've experienced in terms of disdain and anger and uh, just disapproval. Most recently, John Cleese, of all people, you think of him, of Monty Python, as being one of the most innocuous kind of humorists, but he had problems with some of his humor in terms of, we're in a stage, and this is not a, I hope sound like an editorial, but we're in a stage of a kind of strong and sometimes understandable political correctness. So I tried to write a book that was certainly politically correct in the best senses of how I understand that, and it was a difficult struggle, because sometimes the most verboten jokes are the ones that reveal the most and that tell the the greatest stories that need to be told or the most high-charged radioactive jokes are those jokes that tell us things that perhaps um, we don't want to be told but need to be told. And I had to make a real distinction between Jewishness and Judaism. Philip Roth originally made this distinction, but it's an important one. Judaism obviously is a religion. There's a lot of humor that's tied to that. But Jewishness is an identity. It's a consciousness. It's a way of life in many respects. Uh, I'm glad to say that for those of you who observe the Sabbath, I'm here on the Christian Sabbath today which doesn't necessarily mean not doing anything. Like, you know, Orthodox Jews won't even push an elevator on the day because it's a day supposedly to rest. Go figure that one out. Um, so I had a book, but what I was struggling with was a title, believe it or not. And there's a guy who just put out a book, a Columbia University professor, um, uh, and his book is called Jewish Comedy. But originally I was told that it was a Norton, Norton publication, a book well worth reading, a good scholarly work. I was told the original title was Two Rabbis Walk Into a Bar. <laughs> and I thought, that's a great title. Uh, and here it's been taken away from me. And then it turned out he didn't even use that title. <laughs> so I had a number of titles in mind. And actually, one of the titles that I was coming close to using was the title of a joke that leads off the book. That's the first joke in the book. But before I get to that, I thought, let there be laughter because you know, it had almost a mosaic sound to it and it was something that I really wanted to encourage. And it was amazing to some extent when this book came out in September of last year, uh, two months before the election of Donald Trump, how many people were looking for and seeking ardently some sense of laughter after the election. Uh, it became a book that was really highlighted a lot and I was able to write in the Jewish newspaper the foreword about Jewish humor in the age of Trump and all sorts of things along those lines, largely from the touring that I did. But I had, I thought, a cornerstone on almost every major Jewish joke. And then two jokes were, and they happened to be both about rabbis, two jokes were told to me before the book went to press. And I thought these have to be included and I called the editor, and uh, a couple of editors, and I said, you know, we have to hold back. I'll just tell you these jokes and then uh, I'll tell you why they didn't play into the title and what the title became. But they're Splendid jokes because they're about word playing on the one hand, which is very much a part of traditional Jewish humor, and also uh, about marriage, which is, again, as an institution, something that's uh, very much a part of Jewish humor. So the first joke, uh, which is one of word play, has to do, uh, and it's always a privilege to be with Charlie Junkerman because he is indeed what I would call a mensch. And many of you who don't know that word, it simply means somebody who is a real person and a, and a fine person and somebody you admire for being honorable and being sincere. So the joke goes that a guy uh, goes to a rabbi, and as I said, both these jokes involve rabbis, goes to the rabbi and he says, uh, as you know, rabbi, my brother died and you're going to be doing a funeral, aren't you? And the rabbi says, yes, I am. He says, well, I'd like you to say my brother was a mensch. And I know you've got a capital campaign, and I will give a million dollars to the capital campaign if you only say my brother was a mensch. And the rabbi is tormented because he was not a mensch. And he goes home and he says to his wife, we've got this capital campaign. I'm so desperate to reach our capital goal. He offered me a million dollars to say that his brother was a mensch. How can I say that in good conscience, in good, clear conscience? And his wife said, sweetie, you're going to have to worry about that yourself. Work it through. I don't know what to tell you. So the next day, the rabbi gets up at the funeral and he says, um, 
some words about the man passing on, and then he says, look, you're my spiritual community. I have to be completely honest with you. This was an awful man. He was mean to his employees. He was mean to his neighbors. He was even mean to his friends and his family. But compared to his brother, he was a mensch. <laughs> So you see why I wanted to include that. All right. <laughs> but then I came across, you know, I had this uh, sort of challenge to friends and family, come up with a Jewish joke I haven't heard, and there will be a reward. Um, and I got this joke, and it was about a, a rabbi who was giving a sermon, and in the, another rabbi joke, and in the middle of his sermon, he sees a young man who's in the congregation who looks, I'll use a big word, lugubrious. He looks very sad, doleful, and unhappy. And so when the sermon is over, the rabbi goes up to him and he says, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to invade your space or anything, but you look terribly unhappy. I'm a rabbi, I'm a teacher, and I'm a spiritual leader, and maybe you can tell me what's on your mind, and possibly, quite possibly, if I can, I'd love to be able to be of some help to you. The young man said, Rabbi, you have a very good detector there. I have been unhappy for quite some time, and I'll tell you why. He said, I have gone online to try to find a wife, and I've been successively struck by a number of women who I knew I could love and marry. They were really great matches. And in every single case, I took them home, and my mother didn't like them. And this has you know, an element of Jewish mother jokes, too. So the rabbi says, well, there's a new online uh, dating service, and it has a great deal to do with specific personality traits. Let me give you a suggestion. I'll give you the dating site. And why don't you find someone who has some things in common with your mother? I mean, likes the same kind of things she likes and has a number of things, perhaps, of interest and avocations and hobbies. He says, that's a wonderful idea, Rabbi. I'm going to do that. He says, good. I'll see you. And please keep me in the loop and tell me what happens. Three weeks later, a young man appears back in the synagogue, and he's in the congregation, and he looks even more unhappy. <laughs> and so when the rabbi is done with his sermon, he walks up to him, and he says, Tell me what happened. You look even more unhappy than you did when I told you, I gave you, I think, good advice, didn't I? Yes, Rabbi, it was good advice. So what happened? I found a young woman, just like you were suggesting, who had so much in my, common with my mother. It was extraordinary. She not only had common interests with my mother, she talked like my mother, and she looked like my mother. And she cooked like my mother. The rabbi said, well, what was the problem? He said, I took her home. My father hated her. All right. <laughs> It's a great joke, especially for long married couples, um, and, and one for the ages. So I had to add those two jokes, but I still didn't have a title. And there's this wonderful joke. Let me take you for a moment to New York City, where I had the, actually, first in San Francisco, many of you are probably, how many are New Yorker writer, readers? Uh, figures, <laughs> most of you. Um, before, I went to New York to the 92nd Street Y to do an event with Calvin Trillin, also known as Bud Trillin. I did an event with him here at the Norse Theater. And we just had a really wonderful time telling Jewish jokes and exchanging them. And Sidney Goldstein, who runs the City Arts and Lectures program, said, you guys should do that in New York. And I said, let me tell the publisher. And they arranged it. And I asked Adam Gopnik, and he went and uh, was on the panel. I did an event with Jeff Tubin. And he said, I'd like to do this with you guys, but I'd like to be the interlocutor. So we had these big names from the New Yorker, but we didn't have a woman. And uh, we went to the New Yorker, and they suggested Patty Marks, Patricia Marks. So it was a great panel. And you know, all um, mavens when it comes to Jewish humor and Jewish jokes. And Bud Trillin loves to tell this joke that turns out to be the first joke in my book. And let me tell the joke, and then I'll talk about title, and then I'll talk a little bit about what happened. So the joke is, and some of you, it's a, it is a Jewish mother or grandmother joke. I tell it as a grandmother joke. First chapter of my book is Jewish mothers and grandmothers. So this grandmother is at uh, the beach with her grandson, and he's taking sand out with a shovel and putting it in a pail and playing. And suddenly a wave comes and picks him up, literally, literally picks him up and takes him out. And she can't swim. And she's beside herself. And she's screaming and howling and yelling. And please, God, save grandson. This is my nachas. This is my life. This is my, I can't swim. Almost like a miracle, a young lifeguard appears and dives in and brings the kid out. And she's praying and she's going on and on and again. 
importuning God and the lifeguard, please save his life and so forth. Lifeguard starts giving him mouth to mouth. He's blue. He looks in terrible shape. Finally, water spurting out of his nostrils. Out of his... Lifeguard turns to her and says, it's OK. He's going to be OK. She gets out of the prayer position that she's in, puts her hands back and says, he had a hat. Okay. <laughs> Now, it's an old joke. It's a wonderful joke. However, I thought for a while, why not title my book, He Had a Hat? Because it's one of those jokes that's a classic joke that's been around for years. And I mentioned Bud Trillin, not so much to not drop a name, Calvin Trillin. Drop a name, my buddy Bud. Yeah. Um, but because he said this is one of the most archetypical, quintessential Jewish jokes. Maybe that's not the language he used. That's mine. But this is a joke that can't necessarily translate or cross any other borders or barriers. Well, he was wrong. Um, I got a letter after my book came out from someone who said to me, um, that joke was told in a different form by my Norwegian grandmother about <laughs> Norwegians. Right? So you see, what you realize when you go into the depths of these jokes is many of them do cross over. Some of them are what we call sui generis. Some of them are strictly in many ways only for Jews, especially ones that use Yiddish or Yiddishkeit. But a lot of them translate over. And let me give you one example of that before I go on with my talk here. The other, again, sometimes one of my students recently said, Professor Cressy, you shouldn't be self-conscious about dropping names. If you've got names to drop, drop them. But uh, I'm not trying to drop a name here. But Amy Tan, the Chinese-American author, happens to be a friend. And, um, she and her husband, Lou De Matai, had uh, my wife and me over there one night. And she loves jokes. And she was asking me to tell jokes. And then she says, I have one for you. Now, what's interesting about this is I thought she was going to tell me a Jewish joke. Because I knew, well, it turned out I knew the joke as a Jewish joke. But she told the exact same joke as a joke about Chinese. Right? And there are a lot of jokes that do this, that cross over boundaries. So the joke is that a barber opens a new barber shop, and he's got a spiffy new barber pole. And a priest comes in, and he gives the priest a haircut. And the priest goes to pay him. And he says to the priest, no, you're a man of God. I don't accept money from men of the cloth or women of the cloth. I cut women's hair, too. Let's not be sexist in these jokes. And you don't have to pay me. This is for free. He goes out the next morning to get his newspaper. And there's a beautiful crucifix waiting for him with a thank you note from the priest. Then a minister comes in. He cuts the minister's hair. And the minister goes to pay him, and the same exact thing happens. It's replicated. He says, minister, you are a man of God. You're a minister of God. I do not take money from you. Next morning, he goes out to get his newspaper, and there is a Bible inscribed by the minister with his gratitude and thank you. So a rabbi comes in. There's a rabbi a haircut and won't let the rabbi pay. And the next morning, he goes out, and there are 12 rabbis there. Now, uh, <laughs> now <laughs> so, it's a joke that makes us laugh. It's a joke that, you know, you could say, well, our, our Jews, they care about money. They're too enterprising, maybe borderline anti-Semitic joke. No, because Amy Tan tells me this joke without even hearing it about the Jewish guy, rabbi and tells the same joke, except it's a Frenchman, a German, and a Chinese guy. And the Chinese guy is out there with 12 of his buddies. So a lot of these jokes really do have uh, travel to them. What I found was so challenging in writing this book, though, was not so much getting at the jokes, but showing the whole trajectory of jokes. And because you know, it's almost like Fiddler on the Roof. You're in a shtetl. It's an impoverished place. You have nothing really of uh, possessions, almost. Uh, you're living in, in cold, little dingy quarters where there could be a pogrom at any time. And then suddenly, you go over this uh, ship uh, to the new world, and you find yourself in a world where you can actually succeed, where you can make a life for yourself, and eventually, more and more success and prosperity. And I mean, it's an extraordinary story in many ways. But there are jokes out of the shtetl that I had that I was wrestling with, because I was very interested in the folklore and the whole shtetl history. I'll give you a classic example. Two Jews are in front of a firing squad, which is not, by the way, all that anomalous, uh, those Jews who lived in the shtetl. And one says to the other, get a last request. I'm going to ask for a cigarette. And the other one says, shh, you want to get us in trouble? All right. <laughs> It's a painful joke, but it's also you know, funny in a way, because it epitomizes a lot of what Jews had to put up with in terms of the shtetl. Now, you fast forward that joke to the joke. And trust me on this narrative, it's a little bit windy and labyrinthine, but the payoff is worth it. 
Uh, do you know the name Bobby Slayton, by the way? Yeah. You know the name? Who we used to call himself Yid Vicious, a stand-up comic who was hurt when I, he, his name wasn't listed in my book. Um, so we did an event at LA and he turned out to be, uh, we had an interlocutor who used to be the book editor of the San Francisco Chronicle talking to both of us about Jewish humor. It was a real kick with Slayton. Slayton told me this joke. And he told it on the air when I was at ABC and it had, he had to be bleeped. Um, do I have to bleep myself? No? Nobody's gonna be offended? We don't have any FCC regulators here, do we? Or anything? Okay. So here's the way the joke goes. There's, and so many of these jokes begin, obviously, with you have a Frenchman, German, and a Jew in this one, people from different nationalities or whatever. And, but in this joke, it's a tough New York Jew, okay? Contemporary, present day. And they're traveling, you have to accept the Diné of this joke, the given. They're traveling together in the Amazon, okay? <laughs> Why they'd be doing that, I don't even know, but that's how the joke begins, right? So they get captured by a tribe of cannibals. And they take them into the cannibal village. And there's a huge pot that's boiling over with vegetables and all kinds of things. And a guy steps forward with a loincloth on. And he says, I'm the head of this tribe. And obviously, we're a cannibal tribe, Amazon. And uh, we're cannibals, so we're going to kill you and eat you. But I want to tell you, first of all, that we're going to strip your skin off first and use it for a canoe. And it'll be in our tribe for generations. So you'll have an ongoing posterity and purpose. Obviously, I've been educated in the West because I use words like posterity. But aside from that, I want you to know something else. We're going to let you choose the way you want to die because we're enlightened cannibals. <laughs> so he says to the Frenchman, how do you want to die? And the Frenchman, figuring they're cannibals, how, guillotine, he says. Out of his loincloth, he pulls out an ax and chops off the Frenchman's head. It's that simple. Right? He says, a German, how do you want to die? He says, a Luger, figuring, again, they don't possibly have a Luger takes out a little pistol and shoots the German to death. He says to the tough New York Jew, how do you want to die? He says, I want a fork. The cannibal says, a fork? Yeah, give me a fork. He says, I have some utensils here in my loincloth. Takes out a fork, gives it to him, starts stabbing himself with the fork and says, here's your fucking canoe. Okay. <laughs> So I had to work through a lot of these jokes in terms of their meaning, but I had to go through a lot of the sub-themes and the, and the central motifs and the whole trajectory from the old world to the new world and all the rest of that. And the reality is that there are a lot of sub-genres. There's a lot of, um, uh, well, look, most people for a long time thought Jewish humor is about suffering because it was identified with suffering. Jews, thousands of years they've been around, they had to have humor to provide some kind of antidote uh, to or analgesic to the suffering that they've been through. Well, there's a whole array and panoply of Jewish humor. And some of it is suffering, admittedly. Some of it has to do with um, assimilation. Some of it has to do with uh, other patterns, even celebration. When I think about assimilation, for example, um, and assimilation, let me give you a sampling of just how far Jews have recognized they've come from that shtetl where, you know, last request could get us in trouble. I'm going to read this the way I wrote this in the book. I, I, I was very keen on getting these narratives right and writing them in a way that would translate into appropriate narrative prose. So here we have two Texans sitting on a plane. They're going to Dallas with an old Jewish man sitting between them. First Texan says, my name is Roger. I own 250,000 acres, I have 1,000 head of cattle, and they call my place the Jolly Roger. Second Texan says, my name is John. I own 350,000 acres, I have 5,000 head of cattle, and they call my place Big John's. They both look down at the little old Jewish man who says, my name is Lenny Leibowitz, and I own only 300 acres. Roger looks down at him and says, 300 acres, what do you raise? Nothing, says Lenny. Well, then what do you call it, asks John. Downtown Dallas. <laughs> okay. right. now, I see a gentleman here with a somewhat indignant look on his face. These jokes do sometimes 
border what Jews used to be afraid of. I mean, during a period of philo-Semitism, and philo-Semitism, I call it a period because, look, you had all these famous celebrities who were marrying Jews on the one hand, Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor. Um, you had conversions in both cases. You had a conversion of Sammy Davis, and you know the old joke about, which a lot of Jews loved at the time, Sammy Davis gets on a bus in the South. It's Jim Crow. They say, get to the back of the bus. He says, but I'm Jewish. Get off the bus. <laughs> um, okay. But the 50s was a decade of, of real philo-Semitism. Now, I'm sorry to cast uh, a shadow over all this, recent report by uh, the um, B'nai B'rith and the Jewish Telegraphic Institute and others says that anti-Semitism since uh, Trump became president has spiked and spiked to uh, higher than it's been in, in, in many years. Uh, and when you think of Charlottesville and all the rest, blood and soil and all the rest of that, that's understandable. I don't want to cast a pall over this uh, this morning's lecture, but even anti-Semitism became a source of humor uh, for many. I remember when I started out in radio, there was a joke that was going around. Somebody said, yeah, you heard about the guy who tried out for a job as a radio announcer? He didn't get the announcer job, and his friend said, why do you think he didn't get the job? He said, anti-Semitism. All right, it's not a... <laughs> um, and those, those are the kind of jokes, by the way, which don't lend themselves to the politically correct world that we live in. You know. Uh, it sounds like it's ridiculing people who have a stammer or something of that sort, but these jokes definitely had a place historically and, and anthropologically. I'll give you a classic example. I did not include it in the book because I thought it really is somewhat politically incorrect, um, but it's a funny joke, and it was a funny joke at the time. Uh, it was, in that, again, a, a, in that period of the 50s of philo-Semitism. So the joke is that... Um, a young woman joins the Peace Corps. So this is actually even later than, because Peace Corps was John F. Kennedy, as you remember, and Sergeant Shriver, it's the early 60s. But she joins the Peace Corps, and she comes back with a husband who is essentially a Watusi. He's about you know, six foot eight, and he's got a bone in his nose, and the mother comes running out, and she says, I said rich doctor. All right, so, <laughs> sorry, that's a, that's a funny joke. Let me go to um, a different kind of classic joke that's been around for a long time. A couple of Lanzmann fellows Jews see a sign offering $100 to any Jew who will convert. One of the two Jews, Murray, decides to investigate and asks his friend Harry to wait for him. Murray has gone a long time, and when he finally returns, Harry asks, well, did you get the money? Murray says, why is that the first thing you people think about? <laughs> now, this joke has gone through a kind of morphing and, and evolved. Uh, a rabbi up in Sonoma told me the same joke, except it took place on, at, on Wilshire Boulevard in a window, and it was thousands of dollars, and you know things inflate, and they do go through different kinds of changes. But that's a classic kind of joke. And when um, Calvin Trillin said that the real archetype and classic joke is he had a hat, you realize there are a lot of jokes that pretty much fit that bill. Uh, and that, as I said, are, I'll tell you one, in fact, that I think has a similar kind of motif to it. It's the Depression, and there's a sign in a window that says, we convert Jews, $100 each. And man says to his wife, look, you know, we're almost starving. We have no money. Let's do this. The, I mean, the Talmud teaches us we owe allegiance to ourselves and our own life and our existence and survival, first of all, primarily, so let's do it. So they go in, and they go through a conversion. They have holy water, and they have their vows to Jesus and all the rest of it. And the next morning, the man gets up, and he starts to put on the phylacteries, you know, tefillin, which religious Jews put on when they go to prayer. And his wife says to him, what are you doing? Don't you remember? We went through this conversion yesterday. He says, oh, yeah, already I got a goyesha cup. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know Yiddish, goyesha cup means like a Gentile brain. It's a... It's an insulting joke to Gentiles, but it's a way of kind of propping up Jews and giving them a kind of chauvinistic feeling. And there are many jokes, like the Dallas joke, that, that do this in a kind of celebrative way. And there are so many jokes that bring in Yiddish as almost a call to memory. I remember when I saw Love and Death, a movie of Woody Allen's, which has become part of the Me Too movement now, but that's another story. Uh, suddenly, and, and you know, again, this is borderline politically incorrect by today's standards. Um, there's a woman who is clearly cast for her not-fetching looks, almost out of a Fellini movie, 
And he takes her hand. He's supposed to be going to Russia. And he says, it's such a pleasure to meet the Countess Mieskait. And suddenly, <laughs> Mieskait is a Yiddish word, but it has that great onomatopoeic sound to it, Mieskait. It means you know, a homely looking woman. And, and there are other words for men. Um, <laughs> I mean, Yiddish is one of those languages that has more negative and pejorative words and, pro and, and more curse words than probably uh, any language extant. In fact, you know, there's also a joke about Yiddish uh, convention. Uh, I just blew the joke. It's an Esperanto convention. Everybody spoke Yiddish. OK, you get the joke. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this theater in Novato, and I'm here, and I'm, I hear the word miskite. It was what I call a call to memory. It was kind of a, a communal call to memory just by the sensibility that one has growing up hearing Yiddish, as I did, and recognizing the word. And nobody else in the theater, of course, recognized the word. But it was almost as if Alan, Woody Allen, that is, wanted to make this call to memory, as Yiddish often does. I mean, you just hear certain Yiddish words, and it's not only their sound. There's a Japanese man who is told that his wife's having an affair with a Jewish man. And he walks up to his wife, and he says, what's this I hear about you having an affair with a Jewish man? And the wife says, who told you this Mishigas? All right. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, what I began to come down to realize in a very significant way was there are threads in all these motifs, and even in a lot of the light motifs of Jewish humor. A lot of them have to do with separateness. A lot of them have to do with difference, which is similar, of course, in many ways. Chosenness and loss and self denigration or self-abasement, self-flagellation. Yes, a lot of them come out of suffering, but these themes are central, and these themes are the ones that I really found myself working with most of all. Um, but like I said, I let off with the Jewish mother joke because they're so dominant. We've got helicopter mothers now. You know, We've got um, <laughs> tiger mothers. But really, Jewish mothers, in terms of that possessiveness and that domineering quality, were uh, right there in the forefront. I don't know if that's something to celebrate or not, but there they were. Uh, pioneers, you could call them. One of the most exemplary and revelatory jokes is the one about the man who's on his deathbed. And his daughter, his dutiful, loving daughter, is there at his bedside. And suddenly he says, I, he can barely even speak, he says he smells kugel, you know, this wonderful Jewish noodle dish. And his daughter says, Yeah, mom's making a kugel. He says, Just to taste your mother's kugel once before I die. I know I'm at the edge here. And she says, of course, Daddy. And she runs into the kitchen. And he's barely hanging on by gossamer threads. And finally, she comes back, and she folds her hands. And he goes, where's the kugel? She says, Mom says it's for after. Now, another way of telling that is to say, mom says it's for the shiva, but you know, then it, it loses uh, something. It's like, should I realize something? There are a lot of these jokes about Jewish mothers. One of, one of the ones I kind of always favored was the one about the Jewish woman who was really indigent and had to pay for the obituary of her husband by the word. And when she realized this, she said, OK. She said, Mort died, Volvo for sale. <laughs> But there's something about those jokes that really began to take me in on a different level. I began to realize that there's something, just like the joke about the hat, there's something, and I say this as a, as a self-confessed feminist, there's something about those jokes that, strangely enough, has a lot to do with the practical survival nature of Jewish women. Because in so many instances, that's what they had to deal with. Um, they had husbands who spent a lot of time you know, studying the Talmud and the Torah. and uh, who were pretty much not necessarily good earners because they couldn't get jobs. And they had a, women had to take in a lot of sewing and baking and all kinds of things just to scrub through a, li a living. Or the husbands uh, were barely able to uh, make a living as rabbis and so forth. And the reasoning behind this is that there's a practical-minded nature to this that has to do with just having to get by, just having to survive. And it seemed to me that that was a very serious side of a lot of these jokes that I began to realize. A lot of the jokes have Yiddishkeit roots to them, obviously, Yiddish culture roots. But people ask me about, say, Sephardic jokes. Not a whole lot. Mostly they have to do with geography. There are a lot of Israeli jokes, but they're of a different, different breed of joke, if there's a breed about joke. 
A good example is the one some of you may know about. There's a Russian, <laughs> there's a Pole, an American, and an Israeli. And a guy walks up to him, he's got a big clipboard, and he says, excuse me, gentlemen, I'm taking a survey. I'd like to know your opinion of the meat shortage. And the Polish guy says, what's meat? <laughs> and the American says, what's a shortage? <laughs> and the Russian says, what's an opinion? And the Israeli says, what's well, excuse me? Right. So, <laughs> I mean, Israelis themselves love these jokes because you know, it's like New Yorker jokes. Uh, they have similar kind of translating uh, qualities. Um, there's a joke about you know, a woman who's on an El Al airline and a uh, stewardess, uh, flight attendant, excuse me, walks up and says, um, would you like dinner? She says, what are my choices? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> or you know about the Israeli rowing team. It's uh, one guy rowing and seven are yelling. Uh... All right. So when we go to Yiddishkeit, though, where, which is really the root of so much of this humor, we go to a humor that's vested in a remarkable language, uh, which is not a dead language yet, but in fact, there are, one of the things I find heartening is there are young people who are trying to give new life to Yiddish and Yiddish uh, speaking groups and all the rest of that sort of thing. What you find in Yiddish is pre preservation of heritage, of lineage, of, of cadences of words, of just uh, the kind of, not only the use of the Yiddish words, but just the beat of those words. Um, I had the privilege of interviewing the great Nobel Prize winning Yiddish writer, Isaac Bashevis Singer. And I was actually very serious when I asked him, and solemnly, I said, Mr. Singer, do you believe in free will? And he said, I have no choice. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's something unmistakable about that that found its way into what we call the American humor canon. Uh, and it was mainly, of course, uh, Jewish uh, humors. He had the king of the one-liners, Henny Youngman. Uh, I went to the doctor. The doctor said, you're sick. I said, I want another opinion. OK, you're ugly. You know, so. uh, my wife divorced me for religious reasons. She loved money, worshipped it. I didn't have any. You know, just, this is, and the king of the one-liners was succeeded by a guy named Jack Cohen, who took the name Rodney Dangerfield. And Rodney Dangerfield, all he simply said he wanted was respect. I mean, he was right out of a folkloric uh, character that we know many of us is called the Schlemiel. The Schlemiel came into kind of American lexical use, strangely enough, when Sandy Koufax, one of my boyhood heroes, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, who happened to be Jewish, uh, was talking to Joe Garagiola, who was uh, an announcer then, former catcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. And, and Sandy Koufax, out of respect and honor of his religion, which thrilled a lot of Jews, said he was not going to pitch in the World Series on Yom Kippur, which back where I come from in Cleveland, was like a fish holiday. We called it Yom Kippur. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Move west, it became Yom Kippur. So Joe Garagiola had no idea what he was saying. He, said, he, said, he asked him, he said, why aren't you pitching? He said, ah, Sandy Cohen, I guess you could call me a Shlemiel. Garagiola, what's a Shlemiel? I don't know what that is. And he gave the standard old definition. A Shlemiel is a guy, as opposed to the Shlemazel, which means bad luck. The Shlemazel is the one who walks into a restaurant and by accident knocks over uh, pot of soup, the Schlemiel is the one it spills on. You know. um, and Sandy Kovacs was just saying, you know, just call me a Schlemiel. He was being humble and sweet, uh, which was a natural way for him. But Rodney Dangerfield picked this up and said, you know, we get, I get no respect. I'm basically a Schlemiel. Woody Allen, you know, played the Schlemiel to the hilt. And so did many others. Um, even somebody, fast forward to somebody like Richard Lewis, you know, who was always going through pain and always doing this humor based on how much he was suffering, which was a kind of neo-American suffering. I mean, to the point where he said that <laughs> he'd be in bed with his girlfriend and he'd be imagining that, not that so much that she was somebody else, but that he was somebody else, because he felt <laughs> so bad. But you know, you have Rodney Dangerfield says, I went up to this woman and uh, I said to her, uh, uh, I'd really like to go on a date with you. I'd like to meet you. I'd like to have dinner with you. Anything you say, she said, come to my home tonight. Nobody will be there. I went. Nobody was there. You know, so, <laughs> um, well, this was the kind of magic that we had. And uh, 
we've had it very much a part of American Jewish humor. There's also um, something that ought to be said, uh, and by the way, sometimes just the Yiddish cadences. They go back to the shtetl. There's the old one out of the shtetl. Guy goes up to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, why are so many people so ignorant and so apathetic? And the rabbi says, I don't know and I don't care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or, um, <laughs> I mean, that's shtetl humor, but it translates into our own American Republic in so many ways. You know, there's a joke about the three older Jewish women who are sitting uh, uh, in a uh, restaurant, and the waiter walks up and says, Is anything all right? Uh, um, <laughs> Now, do these jokes make older Jewish women into kvetches, you know, into complainers? Of course they do, but it's part of the humor. And it's when you can't, you know, Don Rickles used to always say, if you can't laugh at ourselves, what can we laugh at, you know? And Rickles was, was another kind of Jewish humor. It was a biting humor. It was a humor that was sarcastic. Joe Rivers wound up using that humor to a great degree earlier on. Lenny Bruce did. And I came up with a theory, and I'll tell you, it's, it's a strange... I don't want to walk too far from the microphone. Too many people hard of hearing, right? Um, <laughs> I was at Esalen Institute, you know, which is known, of course, for hot tubbing and all the rest. I was teaching a class down there. And um, I did a class years ago down there in Jewish humor. And it was, it was the most number of people I ever, you know, do these things that I thought were so lofty and noble on literature. And, uh, you know, we get a small crowd. But uh, it was a huge crowd for... Uh, for the Jewish humor class I did. And suddenly it dawned on me, most of you know the story of the golem. Uh, it's, it's out of Prague originally, Michael Chabon's uh, first novel, which won the Pulitzer Prize, The Cavalier and Clay, is based on the golem myth. It's about, it's, it's, a, it's like a Mary Shelley Frankenstein myth. You know, you take this creature and you make it out of clay and it defends you. But it not only defends you, it attacks your enemy. So it's aggressive and passive, or at least holding off those at bay who would come and torture or, hurt you, kill you, uh, and also able to be militant enough to kill the enemies. And I thought, this is what so much of Jewish humor is. It's tied in with defense and attack. Uh, and you know, Rickles is a splendid example of that, but so was Jackie Leonard, so was Joan Rivers, like I said, in her later stage. Well, not so much a later stage. And Joan Rivers used to start out with a lot of jokes about uh, being essentially a a Jewish mother and a Jewish woman and all these kinds of things. Uh, and, and being a woman, she picked up a lot on Phyllis Diller. You know, these were the first two pioneer comedians. And if it hadn't been for Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller, there would probably have been no Sarah Silverman, no Amy Schumer. I mean, they stand on, on the shoulders of giants in that sense. But Joan Rivers you know, became more and more, um, shall we say, blue as she got uh, older. And she always wanted to be like Lenny Bruce. There's a definite lineage there in some ways. But some of that humor, I was telling, I was with some friends before I came here, both uh, distinguished professors here at Stanford. And um, I was talking about the time that I made a friend of mine, there he goes again, dropping a name. Uh, I won't drop her name. I'll just say she's a famous writer and she peed her pants when she heard this joke. It's a, it, it's a, uh, literally, she told me. I wasn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily observe that. Uh, but the, the story was, one that Joan Rivers told about starting to wear open-toed shoes to show off her breasts. Now, <laughs> th that's a kind of, you know, self-denigrating, making fun of myself type of humor. And there was a lot of that, like using naked pictures of her with men on death row so they wouldn't get excited and sexually, <laughs> sexually aroused at all. But later on, she became more, you know, attacking uh, verbally in ways that were funny and that sometimes may have been hurtful to some people, but that was the nature of the humor. And I, I, I made it part of my business, I suppose you could say, to trace these lineages and to go as far back as I could, even to um, the Yiddish stuff. There are all these wonderful classic Yiddish jokes that probably don't even, aren't even told anymore. Myron Cohen, a name some of you may remember. It was on Ed Sullivan. People couldn't believe he had a guy who was doing Yiddish shtick on Ed Sullivan. Jackie Mason was on too, and then he had a feud with Sullivan. He was never let back on. But you, you would see Myron Cohen come out and talk in this kind of thick Yiddish accent and say, uh, hey, a man in Miami Beach, he fell over, and uh, somebody came and put him on an ambulance and put a blanket on him and said, are you comfortable? He said, I make a living. You know, so, uh, <laughs> or um, Joyce is speaking Yiddish. You have these stories like Leo Rostin tells in that wonderful book about uh, 
and, and he, he was the one who wrote those Hyman Kaplan books about learning English as a second language among Yiddish only speakers who came here from the shtetl in Eastern Europe. And the story was, for example, about a man who goes out and he's waiting at the bus and uh, he goes to his class and the teacher says to him, let's see how you know English words. First of all, I want you to spell the word cultivate. And he spells it, C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-E. He says, that's wonderful. Can you use it in a sentence? And he's thinking, he says, yeah. I was waiting at the bus and it was too cultivate, so I took the taxi. <laughs> You still get a lot of mileage, depending on your age demographic, out of these. But that's a wonderful joke because it brings generations together. And in fact, I tell the joke, and I, and I always really love this joke, about a man who's walking with his grandson, and they're going for a walk, and they see a big sign, and it says, in huge block letters, no swimming allowed. And then underneath, in even bigger letters, it says no swimming allowed with many exclamation marks. And the grandfather, Zadie, if you prefer, would he be the Yiddish way, says, come on, we're going to go for a swim. And his grandson says, but Zadie, look, it says up there, it says no swimming allowed. It says it twice with exclamation marks. And the grandfather says, no. It says no swimming allowed. No, swimming allowed. <laughs> You know, I've been asked on a number of occasions, uh, again, how does Jewish humor translate across the Atlantic, across the pond, and all that sort of thing? And there are these Jewish jokes that are sui generis. For example, it's a British joke. It couldn't be told, I don't believe, uh, un under any other aegis or under any other rubric. So it's a joke about a man. He's an award-winning physicist, British native. He's going to be knighted by the queen. And He's there with a number of others who are about to be knighted, and he's wearing a yarmulke, a kippah, a skull cap, right? And the queen goes, and she says, why is this knight different from all other knights? And I say, now that's, for, all right. There's a laughter, probably mainly among Jews, who recognize that as the first of four questions asked in the Passover Seder, unless some of you have gone to Passover Seders. Manishtana halaylo hazeh, why is this knight different from all other knights? So does that translate here? Well, of course it does to some extent, but it's more, I think, a British joke. By the way, when I was doing research for this book, I um, came across something that I just had to include because it was silly and made me laugh out loud. It was so silly. Uh, I had the privilege of interviewing Alan King, who was a great storyteller. I wanted to do a joke off with him, but he said, I'm a storyteller. I'm not a joke teller. Okay. So the story, though, I found about Alan King and doing research about him was that he actually performed in front of uh, Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth. And afterward, after the performance was over, he was back behind the curtains. And the prince and the queen went back to visit him and tell him how much they enjoyed his performance. But before they even did this, the queen said, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. King. And he said, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Queen, which is kind of silly. <laughs> It's silly, but it's wonderful. In some way. Um, it's like the, uh, the old Jewish couple who go across to England and they uh, want to hire themselves uh, the best butler they can possibly find. And where else to get the best butler you can find but England? And they bring back this man named Edwin who is absolutely on every single way the superb archetypal butler. And they say to him, Edmund, we're entertaining our friends the Rosenbergs, set up the table for four people, we're going to go for a walk. And they come back, and everything is set up beautifully, except it's for eight people. And they say, Edmund, there are eight people, eight settings here. Why are there eight settings here? He says, your friends the Rosenbergs called. I'm not doing a British accent. Your friends the Rosenbergs called and said they're bringing the bagels and the bialis. <laughs> OK. Is there a quintessential Jewish joke? Yeah. And I once interviewed a uh, Harvard Jewish uh, scholar and Yiddish scholar, Ruth Weiss. It was a pleasure to talk to her. And um, she also wrote a book on Jewish humor. There are many of us who have. And this joke, which is in my book, and which is a well-known joke, probably. Uh, well, let me tell the joke, and then I'll get into the, a little bit of the conversation we had about it. The joke goes like this. There's a Frenchman, a German, a Mexican, and a Jew. 
and they all scale this very high mountain and they get to the top and they're winded, you know, and they're really flagged. And the German says, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I must have beer. And the Frenchman says, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I must have wine. And the Mexican says, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I must have tequila. And the Jew says, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I must have diabetes. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> it's another one of those jokes that you know some people feel somewhat uncomfortable with maybe and Ruth Weiss said she didn't understand why when she first heard that joke the Jews seemed to really laugh a lot but some of the, the, the Gentiles said Christians said aren't you uncomfortable with that joke it doesn't seem anti-semitic to you on some level and so forth this is the thing about all, a lot of these jokes you know it depends who you tell them to how you tell them who hears them all those things are in the mix, and they're all in the calculus of, of, of telling the jokes and sorting them out. So uh, I'm not going to outwear my welcome here, and I know I'm supposed to talk for about an hour and then take some questions, but let me just go cut to the chase here. Um, a lot of these jokes do push the envelope. And one of the things that's more comfortable about that is that they push the envelope more after the Holocaust, after a number of years of the Holocaust. I mean, Mel Brooks, the producers, when it came out, you know, springtime for Hitler was a shocking thing to many people, including a lot of Jews. Now you got Seinfeld with the, the, the um, I'm sorry, the, the Nazi. Uh, the, yeah, right. It was one of those things, you know, I was just told recently, I got a call from my doctor, I had an MRI, and I said, I have to tell you, first of all, your brain is shrinking. I said, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> It's de rigueur now that they tell you that if you shrinkage your brain. Um, so, and, and you know, then you have Larry David talking uh, about bringing someone who is a survivor to meet somebody who's from the TV show Survivor. I mean, it's as if <laughs> the envelope is being pushed and pushed and pushed. And there isn't all that much necessarily more you can push. And a lot of people are still offended by things of this nature uh, or things that even seem to cross over a border of what might be interpreted as, or interpretable as anti-Semitism. You know, the criterion for me, is it funny? Uh, there are certain things you should avoid because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Uh, I mean, Jackie Mason, for example, made a whole career out of a kind of chauvinism and stereotypes. And some people are offended, but this, uh, part of it's his delivery, because his delivery is like an old Yiddish delivery. You know, I know a guy, he's half Jewish, he's half Polish, he's a custodian, but he owns the building. You know. Uh, <laughs> I know a guy, he's half Italian, he's half Jewish, he can't get it wholesale, he steals it. You know, and other goes, you know, many people are offended by those kind of stereotypes, but you know, if you put down the sense of, ah, it's all in good fun, it's all for the sake of humor, we need laughs, and anything that can make us laugh is worthwhile, it may have a different uh, cast to it. Um, are Jewish American princess jokes offensive? Yeah, probably they are. But strangely enough, they also are a way of saying, look how much we've succeeded. Look at how we can treat our daughters or our wives and so forth. I did a paper years ago with Alan Dundas. Some of you Cal graduates may have known him, one of the most popular professors of all time, because he taught a course in jokes on the, on the Jewish American princess joke. And a lot of them are very funny. You know, the guy wants to be uh, uh, cremated, which is against the Jewish religion, but he says, I want my ashes to be put in Bloomingdale's because I know my wife will visit me at least once a week. <laughs> um, or the Jewish American princess is holding uh, uh, an invaluable vase, a Tiffany vase in Tiffany's, and it f falls out of her hands and smashes into hundreds of pieces. And she says, I'm all right. Um, <laughs> it's funny how some of these things have to do with places like Bloomingdale's and Tiffany's. And then there's the three words a Jewish American princess will never hear. Attention, Kmart shoppers. Uh, all right. So you get the picture, are these jokes to feel uncomfortable with? Well, maybe on some level, but as I said, as I began to deconstruct them, and I'm a great one sometimes for deconstruction, I thought to myself, they are also a way of, and they're mostly made up, let's face it, by Jewish men, and there is streaks of misogyny in some of these jokes, and I don't mean it to speak lightly of that. But at the same time, they're ways of giving tribute to, look, we've made it in America, and we've been able to be prosperous enough that we can make our wives into queens or our daughters into princesses. So there you have a lot of it, and I know I've covered a lot of territory here with history and identity and psychology, but there's a lot to cover in terms of the major themes. Let me just say some final things. And uh, one thing that I want to say 
to end here is that there are jokes too that are hopeful in ways that surprise me and I'll give you a wonderful example of that. As you know, the Jews name after the dead, or at least traditionally have always named after the dead. Um, I, I was surprised when I came to San Francisco, which is so assimilated that I said, what are Jews doing with Roman numerals after their name? But it was true in San Francisco uh, and celebrating Christmas and all kinds of things that you know I didn't grow up with in Cleveland by a long stretch, or those of us in the Midwest or the Eastern Seaboard didn't grow up with. But this is one, of, the Bay Area, for better or worse, is one of the most assimilated uh, areas, always has been. They were mainly settled by San Francisco itself by German Jews, and they were you know, of a different, tri a different uh, tribe in many ways. Uh, reading Amy Chow's book, I'll give it a plug now, who wrote the Tiger uh, Mom book about tribes, and it's a very convincing uh, book about how important tribes are, or tribal identity is. At any rate, one of the first radio interviews I had was a name many of you know, Scott Simon, uh, on uh, Weekend Edition with this book, I mean. And I went on the show, and he said to me, will you please tell, and you'll know why he asked me to tell this joke, tell the joke about the couple that's work, the man and his, and his son who are walking in the 21st century. Some of you may know this joke. The man and his son are walking in, and it's the later part of the 21st century. And the um, man sees the son and the father and walks up to them and says, to the father, your son is such a handsome young man. The father says, thank you. And the man who gives the compliment says, what's his name? The father says, his name is Shlomo. He says, Shlomo? He says, what kind of name is Shlomo? He says, well, he's named after his dead grandfather whose name was Scott. Now, Scott Simon wanted me to tell the joke because the name Scott, and he explained it beautifully. Uh, his father, he was a product of an Irish mother and a Jewish comedian or would-be comedian father. I don't think his father ever went that far. But he said, the joke encapsulates so much in it, not only hopeful of tradition coming back and all that, but also um, the whole assimilation process, naming kids Scott, and then maybe even going back to roots which is one of the hopes that I had in writing this book, that at least young people, you know, because I knew so many people who said, my grandchildren, they know nothing about Yiddish culture, Yiddish uh, language, uh, about any of the traditions, any of their heritage. Uh, you know, they got bar mitzvahs so they could get a lot of gifts. Um, it's a wonderful joke about that, some of you may know, you know, about the, the temple that's having problems overrun by mice. And they bring in a, a rabbi who's supposed to be a miracle worker, and he comes in, and within 24 hours, all the mice are gone. And I said, Rabbi, how did you do that? He said, I just bar mitzvahed them, and they all left, and they'll never come back. You know? <laughs> but, so, it's a kind of painful joke, though, in some ways, you know? It's, again, it's that double-edged sword of these jokes, Damoclesian sometimes at that. All right. um, but that's a hopeful joke, and there are a number of them that certainly are. And you know something I realized when I said, let there be laughter with this title? It's very healthy to laugh. The American Scholar, the last issue of it, had, I'm not sure that the research is all that up on this. Uh, I think, you know, does laughter help our immune system? A lot of people believe, a lot of good scientists believe even that it does. I'm not convinced uh, incontrovertibly, and I'm not a scientist, but, you know, I do dip into that world. Um, but nevertheless, this article took the position it helps our endocrine system, helps our circulatory system. In other words, laughter is good. Laughter can be healing. I think we know that to some degree and can say that or attest to that personally. And let me end with a story by, um, that was told to me soon after my book came out by a personal friend who for many years was a professor here at Stanford, um, Marilyn Yalom, who was married to Erwin Yalom, who was also a professor here. And um, she told me about a book that I, I wasn't aware of that was um, discovered around the time of the Holocaust, or after during the liberation, actually. And the book was in one of these little closet areas. Like, it was like an Anne Frank story. And, and unlike Anne Frank, uh, the woman who had been living there with her son managed to survive. And it turned out that they had so little room, it was like being in a broom closet. But one of the things that they treasured and cherished enough to have with them was a book of Jewish jokes, of Jewish humor. And I tell that because uh, in some ways, I mean, not because of the pain in that story, because there is a lot of pain in that story, 
but because it does, in a way, tell us something hopeful. It tells us that we need humor, and it tells us that humor can keep us, in many instances, alive and kicking, we hope, and vital. And may it do the same for all of you in your lives, and may you have good fortune. It's been a real pleasure to be here. I'm not cutting it off because I was asked to take Q&A, but you know, I would, let me actually end like the Jewish comics do. You've been a great audience. Okay. <laughs>